Yes? You will find that chanting Krishna's names is very powerful because it is transcendental. That is something that we should never forget. If we chant Krishna's names, no matter where we are, in what situation we are in, the important thing is Krishna will protect us. The holy name is the source of all protection. This is very important. In this material world, we want always to be protected. When we are young, we look to our parents to protect us. When we are older, we uh, look to sometimes our friends because we think our parents are getting out of fashion. So we think our friends know better and we look to our friends. When we get older, we look to our spouses, our loved ones, and we think they will protect us. And when we get much older, then others look to us thinking that they can get protection from us. But no matter how old we are, we are also looking for protection. You can ask your parents and they will tell you that they are also looking for protection. So nobody in this material world wants to be free and unprotected. Krishna is the source of all our protections. It is stated very nicely by Arjuna when the Brahmastra was coming at him uh, and it was released by Ashwatthama just after the Mahabharat war. At that point of time, Ashwatthama released this powerful weapon. If you read Bhagavatam and Sastras, they tell us that the Brahmastra was actually what is today known as a nuclear weapon. The only difference is the Brahmastra is not released uh, in a very cumbersome manner the way weapons are released today. Brahmastras in the time of Mahabharat, they were released just by chanting of mantras. That's how powerful these mantras were. So when Ashwatthama released the, the Brahmastra, it was so powerful that it threatened to actually destroy the entire world. And it was coming towards Arjuna and it was coming towards his chariot. And Krishna was on the chariot as the charioteer, and Arjuna was actually sitting on the chariot. And at that point of time, Arjuna could have done a few things. He could have, and he was competent, he was very competent to actually counteract the Brahmastra. You see, the problem with the Brahmastra is that it requires two things for it to be successful. One is to release a weapon, but the other is to pull back the weapon right to revoke the weapon and to release the weapon actually the skill must be learned for both because sometimes a weapon is released only for a specific area for a specific target and then it is revoked however ashwatthama only knew how to release the brahmastra and he did not know how to revoke it and that was actually negligence on his part because without knowing how to revoke it it would mean an all-time destruction of everything and that was not how warfare was during the time of Mahabharata. It was not that way. It was, even though there was enmity between warring parties, it was not on the scale of what we see today, where innocent people are also victims of war. That was not the way it was. There would be two warring parties, they would go to a, uh, uh, an open field, they would fight it out, and that's it. And at the end of the day, when they were together, they would still be friends. Because fighting was for a cause. It was not for greed, nor was it for self-interest. But Ashwatthama's mood was very different. He thought that he could destroy Arjuna. And later he would release the Ashwatthama, he would release the Brahmastra weapon one more time. And he would try to kill Parikshit Maharaj. Because Parikshit Maharaj was the last known descendant of the Guru dynasty. So when Ashwatthama sent that weapon, it was so powerful that Arjuna actually had the capacity to neutralize Brahmastra and revoke it. He had that. He could have done that. But Arjuna did something very different. He got down from the from the chariot. He did Achiman and he circumambulated Krishna. Even though the weapon was of destruction was coming at a very fast pace, that's what he did. And then he chanted he chanted beautiful prayers to Krishna. One prayer comes to mind. Krishna Krishna Mahabaho Bhakta Nam Abhayankaraha this is the first prayer that uh, Arjuna chanted. And this prayer was a very beautiful prayer because this prayer is the prayer that we should always have in our hearts when we receive Krishna on the day of his appearance. He says, Krishna Krishna Mahabaho. 
Krishna, you are mighty armed. In other words, he's looking to the power of Krishna. He's invoking the protection and the strength of Krishna. Krishna is so strong that even though he appeared like a little boy, right? He was like a little boy. Yeah. That's one, how old are you? Eleven. Okay. When Krishna appeared, he was very small. He was much younger than he was eleven. In fact, he started killing demons in Vrindavan when he was a baby. When he was already lying down, right, there was a demon that came. It was Putana, if you recall, right? Putana came. She was the first demon to come and try and kill Krishna. And she was a powerful witch. And if you recall, Krishna had appeared in Nanda Maharaj's house, not because he was born to Nanda Maharaj. Krishna was born to Vasudev and Devaki. And he was born in the most difficult of circumstances. Vasudev and Devaki, where were they? Were they in the palace? Yeah, they were in jail, exactly. They were in the prison. And they were in prison not for one year. They were in prison for seven years. From the time the first child was born, they were already imprisoned. And yet, because they were great devotees of the Lord, and they prayed for Krishna's protection, even though they were in a very difficult surrounding, they did not feel it. This is the principle of protection. When we feel protected by Krishna, when we invoke the power of Krishna, then it doesn't matter if our surroundings are challenging. It doesn't matter if people around us are difficult. It doesn't matter if the atmosphere is not congenial. It doesn't matter whether our body is cooperating or our health is failing. But our protection is the protection of our consciousness. This is very important. From a material level, we all want to protect our bodies. That's natural, because we want good health. Without good health, you and I won't be sitting here. You'll all be calling Sumit Prabhu and and saying, I'm not well. I won't be able to come. But the more important protection that we seek from Krishna is the protection of our mind. Because this mind is the greatest enemy. It's not an outside person who's an enemy for us. Very often, outside people give us trouble because our mind allows it. If our mind is very strong, then no matter what disturbance there is, we will not feel it. We will not feel it. So therefore, when Krishna, when Arjuna chanted, Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, Bhaktana, Abhayankaraha. Bhaktana means his devotees. Abhayankaraha means fearlessness. So Krishna awards fearlessness to his devotees. That is the nature of Krishna. And even when Krishna was just a little child, when he was just born, Right? And mind you, we use the word born very loosely because Janmashtami doesn't mean the birth of Krishna. Janmashtami means the appearance of Krishna. Krishna was not born <clears throat> the way you and I were born. You know, we came to term for nine months and then our mother struggled and then we came out into the world. It's a very messy affair. But Krishna being born was very beautiful. In Bhagavatam, it is stated that Krishna, first of all, appeared in the mind of Vasudev. He appeared in the mind. Why? Because Vasudev's mind was very pure. When our mind is pure, we can receive Krishna. But when the mind is full of dirt, when the mind is full of material desires, there's no place for Krishna. But Vasudev's mind was very pure. And so at the appointed hour of Krishna's appearance, Vasudev received Krishna in his mind. And then he transferred Krishna from his mind to his heart. We always say that Krishna is in the heart of everyone. But if Krishna is in the heart of everyone, then what is the need for him to appear? Right? Some people can question that. Right? Some people say, why do I need to attend Janmashtami? Krishna is always in my heart. Yeah, we say that. Sometimes you say, why Prabhu do I have to go to temple? Krishna is in my heart. I don't have to go to temple. I'll just watch TV. That's enough. <laughs> so the mind is very smart, you see. It gives you very favorable arguments. But the point is, there is a vast difference between Krishna being present in your heart and appearing in your heart. Very different. Someone may be present in the house, but if he's not welcomed, then he may be present, but he doesn't appear. He's not part of your surroundings. He becomes part of the furniture. Sometimes we have Krishna in the house. You know, we have a statue of him, but we see him only as a statue. Sometimes we have Murti of Krishna. But in the rush in the morning, we say Hare Krishna. In the evening, we say Hare Krishna. In between, we forget him. That is Krishna being present in the house, but he's not appearing in our hearts. You see the difference? 
So Janmashtami is not just an event where Krishna appears in this world. Janmashtami is an event when Krishna must appear in our hearts. And true enough, Vasudev, Krishna did not appear uh, coming from the womb of Devaki. He first started coming into the mind of, uh, of Vasudev. Vasudev transferred Krishna into the heart, his heart, because the heart is the seat of our sincerity. And then after that, he then transferred, he then transferred Krishna who was in the heart. He transferred him into the heart of Devaki. So therefore, Sastras tell us that the birth of Krishna is not birth. Never mistake Krishna coming into the world like an ordinary child. He was not. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is Govinda Madhi Purusha. He is, he, he is actually Aham Sarvasya Prabhu, Mattaha Sarvam Prabhantate. He is the origin of all material and spiritual worlds. That is Krishna. So he does not come in the form of a baby and then one day he wakes up and he is God. No. Our Acharyas tell us, God is always God. You and I can never become God. We will become servants of the Lord. We are part and parcel of the Lord. But never think for a moment that we can become God. God is always God. Just like if you are born to your father, you can never say that you will become the father. Father is always father. And daughter is daughter, son is son. You will always have an, an, a relationship with your father. But you cannot be the father. That is why he is father. That is why she is mother. Even in the material world, we understand that concept. But in the spiritual world, we miss that point. So Krishna is always Krishna. This is very important. We all have an eternal relationship with Krishna, but we are individual spirit souls. And we are uniquely and eternally related to Him. That is very important. Each one of us, no one is out of this equation. Everyone is related to Krishna. But the only way we can revive this relationship is actually to do what Vasudev did. Vasudev received Krishna. Why? Because he saw Krishna as Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho. Right? And therefore he received Krishna and he then transferred Krishna from his heart to Devaki Mata. So therefore, there was no, there was no um, intercourse. There was no union between male and female. Krishna is above that. He is not of this material world. And therefore the Acharyas say that the appearance of Krishna is a heart-to-heart -heart transaction. It is a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. That's how Krishna appears in our heart. And then when Krishna appeared in the heart of Devaki Mata, she became so effulgent because the Lord was in, was in her that all the devatas surrounded her. The prison was very dark, remember. But she began to illuminate the prison because of Krishna being inside her. And at that point of time, the devatas came and they all circumambulated Devaki Mata and they chanted the beautiful prayers known as Purusha Shuktas. Uh, they're very famous prayers. And after they chanted these prayers, they left. What was Vasudev's reaction when he first saw Krishna? Bhagavatam said he was so happy to see Krishna because when Krishna came, when he appeared, right, he, when he appeared at the point of his, the time of his, of his appearance, he came out of the heart of Devaki Mata. And when he came out of the heart, he came in the form of the four-handed Vishnu. He did that for two reasons. He did that first so that we cannot look back one day and say, oh, he was just an ordinary baby. No ordinary baby comes out in the form of the four-handed Lord. The four-handed Lord shows that he is supreme. That is the first reason. The second more confidential reason why Krishna came as the four-armed Vishnu was actually Vasudev's Ishta Devata was Lord Vishnu. And so when Vasudev saw, my, 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 my Ishta Devata has actually come before me, he became very happy. And even though Kamsa had already sworn to kill this eight child of Devaki, and actually they should be very afraid, but Bhagavatam tells us Vasudev was fearless because he knew that Krishna had come. He knew his chosen Lord had come and nothing can happen. Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, Bhakta, Nam, Abhayankara. So this is how when we take up devotional service, when we receive Krishna into our hearts, what happens? Fearlessness comes into our hearts. This is how we get protection from Krishna. Very important. 
Now, Devaki Mata's reaction to Krishna was very different. She was not fearless like Vasudev. Oh, by the way, Vasudev did one other thing that's very interesting. He didn't have anything to offer. You know, whenever it's very auspicious, someone is born, we there's a tradition of giving away things, isn't it? You give away sweets, something. But in those days, they would give away cows. They would give away jewels, especially if you come from the Vaisha community. Vasudev, I mean, Vasudev was actually uh, not even Vaisha. He was actually uh, he was actually of princely caste because he was actually the son of Surasena. So he was very powerful, actually. But he didn't have anything with him because he was in jail. So mentally, he offered a hundred thousand cows to everyone, just mentally. And that shows the magnanimity of a devotee. A devotee is so, so, he has so much faith in Krishna that even at that point of time, he expresses his gratitude to Krishna. But Devaki Mata played the role of a mother. So when she saw the four-armed form of Vishnu, she became fearful. Not of Vishnu. She became fearful that her brother Kamsa would soon come. And when he saw the four-armed form of Vishnu, he would know this definitely is the personality coming to kill me. She didn't want to lose her child. So she told Krishna, please stop looking like the four-armed form of Vishnu. Just look like a baby, please. Because if you look like a baby, I may try to convince my brother, just an ordinary child. How can an ordinary child kill you? So she was fearful in that way. Now, she was always fearful of Kamsa. But Bhagavatam tells us, Devaki Mata represents Bhakti. Kamsa represents material association. A devotee is always careful whom he or she associates with. You all know the value of association, isn't it? Look at these children. They are very good examples of association. Both of them have taken out their books and they are writing notes. I tell you it's because of their sadhu sangha. Each one is encouraging the other. And I see so many other children here. Everyone's very quiet. I've never been to a program where children have been so quiet. It's quite amazing. Quite amazing. Why? Because you are in the right company. In the company of devotees, you remain devotees. But in the company of demons, even if you're a devotee, if you're not careful, you can actually move away from bhakti. That is the power of association. So devotees are not weak, but we recognize this material world is a difficult place to be. Many of you are parents. You know how fearful you are whether your children are going to pick up bad habits outside when you are having good habits at home. When they come home and speak in language that you never recognize, you know that must be Asad Sangha. And you want to give them Sadhu Sangha. So in the same way, Bhakti Devi is represented by Devaki. And if you want your Bhakti to grow, take the right association. That's why Sumit Prabhu and Vrinda Mataji have organized this program. They are giving Sadhu Sangha. Right? They are creating a Sangha of devotees who can come together week in, week out hear about Krishna and become very peaceful and become fearless in your life. It is a very, very invaluable service actually. So when Krishna came that way, Devaki Mata said, become a small child. And of course, he is, right, the servant of the devotees, even though he's supreme personality of Godhead. So he very, very obediently obliged and he came in the beautiful form of a blue-eyed boy. And then he praised and thanked his parents for receiving him in this world. But now we have the problem of Kamsa, isn't it? But Krishna always has a plan for everything. So Krishna tells Devaki and Vasudev, Vasudev particularly, carry me out of this prison. Vasudev was thinking in his mind, how is that going to happen? I'm in shackles, I'm in chain, the doors are locked, guards are outside, <laughs> Kamsa will be informed in a while. How am I going to get Krishna out of this, this house? This prison, I can't. But Krishna said, bring me across the Yamuna river and put me in, bring me to Gokul, bring me to Vrindavan, and there put me in the house of Nanda Maharaj and put me there, right, in front of Yashoda Mata. And when you do that, there is a baby girl. Bring that baby girl here. So there was a transfer. You know? And so Vasudev was ready to do it because he had faith in Krishna. And because he had faith in Krishna, Krishna created a favorable situation for him. So two things we must take back today. 
when we have protection, when we have fearlessness in our heart, that Krishna is going to protect us, Krishna makes arrangements always to protect us. We don't have to worry. He will make the arrangements. When we think that Krishna has given us a mission or something to do, a service, and we think we are not worthy of that service, but if we have faith that Krishna will give us the opportunity to do that service, Krishna will provide the strength to do that service. He will. And so the moment Krishna stopped speaking, the guards outside went to sleep. They went into what we call yoga nidra, right? It is not ordinary sleep. They went to sleep. The doors unlocked, the chains and the shackles dropped, and Vasudev was free. He picked up Krishna, but he realized that it was a dark night. The moon was full, but the clouds had come and it was starting to rain. He felt Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead and he's going to walk in the rain. It's not like I have an umbrella in prison, you know, where I can carry it for Krishna. But the moment Vasudev thought that way, Anantasesha, who is none other than Balramji, appeared as a snake with many hoods and he became the umbrella to serve Krishna. And so Vasudev and Krishna were protected by the protection of Balaramji. And they walked in the darkness of the night to Yamuna River. Now when they reached Yamuna River, because of the rain, the river was in spate. It was very high tide. And Vasudev again was thinking, how am I going to cross this river? But Yamunaji was so happy that Krishna had appeared. And therefore, in ecstasy, she parted so that she could serve the Lord and his pure devotee. And Vasudev started walking on the bed of the Yamuna River. As he walked Yamuna River, she was feeling, you know, if somehow or another Krishna can just touch me, I will be very happy. That touch of Krishna is known as Brahma Sparshanam. When we are touched by Krishna, we are purified. Now, Krishna doesn't have to touch us physically. By chanting the holy names of the Lord, you are touched. By writing about Krishna, you are touched. You are touched simply because you are writing notes. By hearing about Krishna, you are touched. By doing arati, like you all saw, right? By doing arati, you are touched. By witnessing the arati, you are touched. This is all Brahma Sparshana. But Yamunaji wanted to be touched anyway. And so she prayed to Krishna. And Krishna slipped out of Vasudev's hands. Vasudev went mad. He thought, I've lost the child, you know. But Krishna just wanted to uh, fulfill the desire of his pure devotion. And so Yamunaji allowed, was allowed to touch the baby just for a while, Krishna. And then Vasudev picked him up and they went over to Vrindavan. All was dark. Even in the house of Yashoda Mata, everybody was asleep. Yashoda Mata had just given birth, so she was exhausted. Bhagavatam says she did not even know whether she had given birth to a boy or a girl. This is very important, isn't it? Why? Because the exchange is going to take place. This is also Krishna's arrangement. This is also Krishna nature. She was so exhausted, she had no idea. Who did I give birth to? Today we all know the gender, three months before. There was no gyni at those times. Nobody went to see scanning and everything. They just gave birth, that's it. So she didn't know what was happening. But she had actually given birth to a, the sister of Krishna. And that is actually Yoga Maya, right? This is Yoga Maya. But she was in a swoon. So Vasudev came walking in. Nanda Maharaj was asleep. He was a very good friend of Vasudev. And he put Krishna there. Now imagine Prabhu said, Mataji, you have been praying for thousands of years and in two different lives, Vasudev and Devaki prayed and prayed and performed severe austerities to receive Krishna. Only to have Krishna leave them on the first day of his coming to the world. What a great sacrifice. What great devotees they are. Even though Krishna may not physically be with us, it doesn't mean that he's not with us. He's in the form of his books. He's in the form of Bhagavad Gita, in the form of chanting. So devotees don't feel that Krishna has left us. We always feel protected by Krishna. And so at that moment, Vasudev had done his part. He walked back through Yamuna, went back into the prison, and the shackles came back. The doors got closed. The guards woke up. Yamunaji went back normal. Yashoda Mata woke up. She looked and she said, hey, it's a boy. I thought it was a girl, but it was a boy. But Vasudev had brought back the baby girl and he left her there and she started to cry, deliberately of course. Kamsa heard from the palace that the eight child of Devaki had been born. The eight child who was forecasted eight years ago, 
by a disembodied voice while he was getting on the chariot to drive his sister Devaki, right? He was just married to Vasudev. He was just riding them. At that point, the voice came out. Eight years later, Kamsa thought, today is the day I will kill this child. So he walks in only to see with surprise that the child is a girl. And Devaki Mata now implores him, my dear brother, this child is said to kill you. The girl will do you no harm. She is your niece. Please, don't do this to her. But the problem with demonic mentality is we always act out of self-interest. It is stated in Sashtras, the difference between a demon and a devotee is self-interest. A demon will do anything and everything if it suits him or her. But if it is for other people's benefit, the demon is not interested. So we have to ask ourselves, are we demons or are we devotees? The more selfish we are by nature, the more demonic is our tendency. The more ready we are to sacrifice and give and serve, the more divine is our tendency. This is very, very important actually. So we should remember that Kamsa only wanted to be nice when it was serving him. But when it was not serving him, it didn't matter. So now he was heartless. He picked up the child and he tried to smash her to the ground so that he could kill her. But instead of going down, the child went up and she displayed a beautiful form of yoga maya, all eight hands armed with weapons, right? And she started laughing at, the, uh, at Kamsa. Now that's the other thing demons don't like. They don't like being laughed at. Mm -hmm. And Kamsa was very upset. And she said, Kamsa, you are a fool. You remember the first time when Kamsa got on the chariot, the disembodied said, voice said, Kamsa, you are a fool. On the eight child coming, same thing Yoga Maya repeated. Kamsa, you are a fool. Demons don't like that. They don't like being told they are foolish. You are a fool because the eight child of Devaki has been safely born and is out there. And you can do nothing about it. If someone tells you that, you become very frustrated, isn't it? And of course, you know, to throw in uh, more drama, Yoga Maya laughed and that would have made Kamsa more angry and she vanished. Now Kamsa became very fearful because the eighth child of Devaki was already alive. And so because he became fearful, he thought maybe Devaki and Vasudev could save him. So what did he do? He fell down at their lotus feet and begged for forgiveness. After killing seven children, he then came to his senses and said, please forgive me. And when Devaki was lamenting, you know what he told her? He told her, my dear sister, don't lament for your seven children. The soul is eternal. The body is temporary. So whatever that died was not actually your child. The soul continues. Very, very good in Sastras. But behavior is very demonic. And this is also very dangerous. Demons know their Sastras very well. <laughs> but whether they act on them is a different story. Hiranya Kashipu also knew his, uh, his Sastras very well. Ravana was very advanced in Vedic knowledge. But their behavior was demonic. But Vasudev and Devaki were so kind that out of their kindness, they decided to forgive him. In fact, Vasudev picked him up and said, My dear Kamsa, please don't feel bad. Whatever has happened is according to the Lord's will and we have accepted it. Please go and be peaceful. Vasudev and Devaki were just happy that Krishna was somewhere. But they did not put much hope in Kamsa because they knew that demons change their minds very often. And true enough, when Kamsa went back to the palace, hardly 10 minutes walk. But in 10 minutes when he went back, his mind was starting to change. And when he sat down with all his friends, you know, we are in Sadhu Sangha, they also had their Sangha. The friend said, Kamsa, you are a fool, third time. Why are you so foolish? All you have to do now is exercise your power. Become king, right? Imprison your own father, Ugrasena. Become a king. And then send out a decree that any child born within 10 days from today, the birth of Krishna, will be killed. We will kill the child. We will kill the children for you. We will send the great demons. And that's why Kamsa would send Putana. Putana was sent specifically. Her mandate was very simple to kill all the children born in the first 10 days. And so she would dress up looking like a very beautiful and chaste Datri, a nurse. And she would walk into Vrindavan Dham 
and pretend that she was a nurse. And she would walk into the house of Nanda Maharaj and she would pick up Krishna. Now when she sees Krishna, she would think this child is so powerful that this child can actually destroy the world. She could sense that, but she thought I'm more powerful than this child. And she was afraid of Kamsa. And so she would give milk from her breast, but it was filled with poison. And she thought this poison will kill Krishna. But Krishna is so powerful that when he sees Putana, he would close his eyes as if he was afraid. But he wasn't afraid. He was closing his eyes because he thought, I have to kill a lady, but she is a demon. And therefore I must do my part. And so when she gave him her breasts for milk and poison, Krishna took the milk, just like a child takes it from the mother. But he also took all her poison and he purified her by taking the life out of her. Putana started shouting and shouting and shouting, you know. And she said, leave me alone, leave me alone. All her body parts, right, she felt were just the very vitality of her life was being taken out by Krishna. But Krishna was very merciful to her because when he took her life out of her, he also purified her consciousness. And when she assumed the real demonic form as Putana, she looked like a mountain. And when everyone saw the mountain and they saw Krishna on top of her, they were thinking, what happened to Krishna? How did he get there? They took him down and the gopis became very scared. They thought, you know, these are evil opens. And you know, sometimes we think, you know, that our children have been blessed too much or people have too much of an eye on them. We call it drishti, isn't it? So what we do, we do all kinds of things. In Vrindavan, they would take the, the tail of the cow and they would sweep it three times around Krishna. Anyone got it before? No one? Okay. You take the cow and you take that. Then they would take cow urine, which is very pure, and they would sprinkle on Krishna. Right? Today, people are horrified when we tell them that. But actually, cow urine is very pure. And they would do that. And then they prayed to all the devatas and they prayed to Lord Vishnu, please protect Krishna from such demons. Completely not realizing <laughs> that Krishna had taken the life out of Putana. And when they had to burn Putana because she was like a mountain, we just burnt her. You know? Instead of coming out smelling very bad because when bodies are decomposed and they burn, the smell is very bad. Bhagavatam tells us the smell of Putana was aromatic. Why? Because of Brahma's passion. She had been touched by Krishna. And Krishna was so kind to her that he awarded her the position of a nurse in Vrindavan eternally. Why? Because she just pretended to be a devotee. That's all. She wasn't even a devotee. Sometimes, you know, we want to be devotees or we want to be seen as devotees. We may look like devotees, we may carry Bhagavad Gita everywhere around, but actually in our hearts we are not devotees. But even if we pretend to be devotees, Krishna is so kind that he accepts it anyway. So what more if you try to be a devotee? Of course, we're not encouraging you to pretend to be a devotee. But try. There's nothing wrong. I remember I received my first Bhagavad Gita when I was 13 years old. And to tell you the truth, I didn't know what it was. But I just liked the Gita. I like books and the book looked very nice. So every time I used to go to school, I would put the Gita in the bag and I would carry it. And for so many years, I just carried the Gita. I would take it out and read it. And I thought I was a devotee. I was pretending to be a devotee. But the Gita finally transformed my life. Because after pretending, how long can you pretend? Eventually, you have to open the book and read, isn't it? And when I read it, I realized that the value of the book is much more than pretending to read the book. So, Krishna is so kind that Putana pretended, but he awarded her mercy. All of you are not pretending. You have sincerely come to see Krishna, to be with Krishna. How much mercy will Krishna give all of you? So this is how Nanda, this is how Kamsa was very afraid. And this is how he sent Putana. But before that, and we close the story here. Before that, these courtiers told him, send out demons one after the other and find Krishna and kill all the children within 10 days of his birth. And what did Kamsa do? He had just asked forgiveness from Devaki, Mata and Vasudev. But in his mind he thought, actually, this will serve my self-interest better. Isn't it so? Self-interest again. And so then he said, let me do that. He took down his own father, Ugrasena, imprisoned Ugrasena. He became king of the Boja dynasty, Andaka dynasty, Vrishni dynasty and Yadu dynasty. 
He put everyone into a reign of terror. And he, he manipulated demons and hired demons. And he got demons to spoil the lives of the saintly people. And then he started sending demon after demon to Vrindavan. Because he had an idea that Krishna was actually in Vrindavan. Putana went and she died. Vatsasura went and he died. Bakasura, the heron, you know, the bird, he died. And then uh, there was Agasura, the big serpent. That big serpent came and saw Krishna playing with all his friends in the forest. And the serpent thought, let me become very big. And he opened his mouth so wide that the bottom of his, um, of his mouth was on the floor, but the top of his mouth was in the sky. And his tongue was like a highway, right? It was like a highway. And his, his eyes were like huge caves. So the boys were with Krishna and they were all playing. They had gone for a picnic like they did every day, taking the calves and playing. They would pack their lunch baskets and they would bring them. As they were running, they would steal each other's basket and throw to each other. They would imitate sounds of the cuckoo birds and the peacocks. They would disturb the frogs in the Yamuna river pond and jump in when the frogs also jumped in. They were all playing. They were fearless. And suddenly they saw this huge snake with the mouth open. And they thought, Krishna is with us. This looks like a snake. And the breath of the snake was foul, you know, because it was eating so much of rubbish. So it was coming out from the mouth like a big cave. But the boys thought, this, this cave looks very interesting. Let's go in. Now, even the devatas who were watching that pastime became afraid. Even the devatas were afraid of Agasu, actually. Because Agasu was so powerful, they didn't have the confidence to even fight him. But these boys, Bhagavatam tells us, they were unafraid. They were not afraid. They were fearless. Why were they fearless? Because we come back to the point that we spoke about today. They were fearless because they had full faith that Krishna will give them protection. And true enough, they entered. And when they entered, Krishna became anxious. Because all the time he thought he could protect them outside, but now they had gone inside. So Krishna entered Agasura. And he decided, let me end the Agasura. So he expanded himself till he filled up the entire space of Agasura that Agasura could not breathe. And through the top of Agasura's head came his life. And he died. And all the boys were rescued by Krishna from the mouth of the fearful serpent. And Bhagavatam tells us that when the boys came out and they saw Krishna, not at any point of time were they afraid. Because they knew Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, Bhakta, Nam, Abhayankaraha, Tommeko, Dhaya, Mana, Nam, then Upper Vargo, Sisam, Sritehe. Krishna, Krishna, you are the most mighty armed. You award fearlessness to the devotees. And only through you and through your mercy can we come out of this terrible material cycle of birth and death. So please, Krishna Janmashtami is more than just <clears throat> the birth of Krishna. Krishna is not born. He appears. Right? And He is present in our hearts. But we need to purify our hearts. Then He will appear. Then He will appear. So if you want to invite Krishna, purify yourselves. How? Chant Krishna's names. Not once a week, but every day. These programs are meant to ignite the eternal relationship with Krishna. And we should not be <clears throat> Sunday devotees. Sunday devotees means we come today, we all sadhus. Monday, forget it, we become tamsas. We, sh we should not be that way. We should be in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, we will be in Kamsa consciousness. So which one we want? We want Krishna or we want Kamsa? Children, who do we want? Krishna, right? Anyone has second thoughts? No one? Do you want Krishna or Kamsa? Krishna, yeah. So shall we chant Krishna's names? Are there any questions? Children, you were writing a lot. Anything I can help? Any questions? Thank you. Yes. Mm. She was in the previous part, uh, something related to Maharaj's body. Uh, yes. Our Sashtras also tell us that actually Putana in previous lives was actually, actually she was not so demonic. Unfortunately, because she, she actually had a desire. She was a sister of Bali. And though she was born into a demonic descendant, 
but she possessed the desire to actually somehow or another nurse Krishna, even though she had demonic tendencies. But when she saw Vamandev, and when Vamandev appeared in his beautiful pastime, she had just looked at him because Bali was there, his, his family was there, uh, and, and his, his wife was there, so his sister was there. And she saw, and when she, when she saw the beauty and the splendor and the effulgence of this beautiful form of the Lord, like a tiny child, she had a desire in her heart that somehow or another I should try to be a mother to such a child. Just a little desire, Mataji. But Krishna is so powerful that he gave her the benediction of fulfilling that desire. But because she was not a pure devotee, she had to be, she had demonic tendencies. So he allowed her to take the form of Putana. But even though she came, and she came with one intention, he remembered her earlier intention. And he fulfilled that intention, and he protected her consciousness, and he purified her in this life. So that's a very beautiful story to understand. So actually every demon in one sense, right, is not really a demon. These demons are very powerful. The only problem with them is that they lack faith in Krishna. Sometimes there are moments when they see the beauty of Krishna. When Kaliya was actually going to fight with Krishna and Krishna entered the river Yamuna, when he saw Krishna, Kaliya who is envy personified, he actually thought, my God, Krishna looks so beautiful. He looks so beautiful. And then suddenly he became Kaliya again. No, 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 no. I'm envious of him and I want to fight him. So in Kali Yuga, it is stated that we all have demonic and divine tendencies in us. We have a little bit of Asura and we have a little bit of Devata. It depends. Today we are all Devatas, right? After this, we have Prasadam, we'll still be Devatas. After that, only the real question is there. <laughs> how much are we Asuras and how much we are Devatas? So Krishna consciousness is not about judging. It's more about the fact that everybody has a chance to transform themselves. It's about transformation. Very nice point. Thank you, Mataji. Let's chant Krishna's names. Sumit Prabhu, we're okay? Okay. Let's chant. So after hearing so much, you know, I hope you will chant as loudly as you can. Not too loudly. Okay. No, we'll do for 10 minutes. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama 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 Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna